What's up, Star Talk fans? You know, a lot of you have reached out to me and asked, when am I doing a comedy special? Well, guess what? It's happening. That's right. This fall, I'm taping my first science comedy special here in Manhattan. So if you're going to be in the area, I want you to be there because I need the most science literate audience that I can have. And that means you. So go to ChuckNiceComic.com and use code STARTALK for your exclusive chance to make a pre-sale purchase for the tickets. It's a very limited supply of tickets, so you want to do it as early as possible, and that means now. ChuckNiceComic.com, use code STARTALK, and we'll see you this fall with the rest of the StarTalk gang. This is StarTalk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Got with me Chuck Nice. Chuck, how you doing, man? Oh, great, man. How's it going? All right. You're my, my, my co-host extraordinaire. Oh, Just fantastic. Thought, I don't tell you that as often as I want to. I'll take it and, anytime and, I can get it. <laughs> We've got a special guest today. Yes. A longtime friend and colleague, Madam Saturn. Yes. I, I, does she have a name beyond that? I don't know, and I don't think so. But <laughs> <laughs> until we verify, let's call her Carolyn Porco. Carolyn, welcome back to Star Talk. Thank you. It's great to be here. And hello to both of you. You both look great. It's good to see you. Excellent. Again. Good to see Excellent. you. Excellent. We got you on because we're going to talk about world changing, civilization moving space images. Yes. And you've been a part of this, this parade of cosmic perspectives that have come to us from photography in space. And I'm delighted to sort of get your take on this and what roles you played in the past, present, and maybe even the future. So, Carolyn, I've got a three-line bio for you. This is, I think, cap encapsulates why we've got you on the show today. You were a member, a member of the Voyager imaging team. Voyager was launched back in 1977, so you've been at this for a while. You're also a leader and, and head of the imaging team of Cassini. That was NASA's mission to Saturn. And are currently your visiting scholar at UC Berkeley. And my favorite planet after Earth is Saturn. And so every day I was looking at my inbox to see if a new beautiful image was coming from your Saturn portfolio. So, uh, Carolyn, welcome back to Star Talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And let me add to that three line resume, Carolyn, that on July 19th, 2013, uh, you oversaw the an image taken by the Cassini spacecraft while it orbited Saturn called the day the Earth smiled. Yes. And many have called that uh, the greatest selfie ever taken. Yeah. So, Carolyn, as I've come to understand, the early planetary probes, as conceived by NASA, did not contain cameras. They contained all manner of sophisticated scientific equipment to measure like magnetic fields and 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 plasma densities and all this, but not photos. And so, what do you know about the history of this this resistance? Yeah, it has a very interesting history, and not surprising. Carl Sagan is involved in this because he mm -hmm. was one of one of the original uh, planetary uh, planetary scientists. In fact. The Voyager imaging team leader, Brad Smith, referred to Carl as the first planetary scientist. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was the first Mariner mission to Venus. Uh, this was going to be the first mission to a planet because we'd have been with, you know, Ranger, Surveyor, so on to the moon. Uh, it was the first mission to Venus and the... And Venus is, of course, the closest planet to Earth. So it, why wouldn't it be Venus? You go to the closest place. Yeah, good idea. So anyway, uh, they, <laughs> the, sci the scientists, the scientists involved in that mission, did not want to carry a camera, and they said, and this was told to me by Carl. They said that uh, they thought essentially that cameras were for kids. You know, there was no really, uh, you know, important science that could be done with a camera. And it was Carl, uh, Carl tried to convince them that that wouldn't be a, you know, a, a sensible thing to leave off a camera. Uh, and they didn't believe him and he lost the battle, but he won the war because uh, all future missions thankfully carried cameras. And it's just, it's, it just shows you how silly people can be because what is an imaging device, especially a space imaging device, 
that takes, uh, you know, this of a scene and turns it into an array of numbers, which get relayed back to Mother Earth. What is that except a bunch of detectors? In fact, in the case of Cassini, a million, a thousand on a side, uh, a million individual detectors arrayed in two dimensions. They're, they're okay. These scientists were okay with carrying one detector that could just look in one spot and take whatever information it needed. For some reason, they did not like the idea of a two-dimensional array of a million of these things. Uh, but anyway, that's, it's true. It was, there was really strong pushback against carrying a camera. And we know- But isn't it, it's not, well, it's not because they were just ignorant. It's that if you're gonna carry a camera, that means you can't carry something else, right? Every ounce matters on these space missions. Okay, but what they couldn't see was the utility in imaging data. That's really what it came down to. But, yeah. you know, with cameras, I don't, they didn't do this on the early missions, but with cameras, of course, you can take movies, you could see phenomena as they're developing, and you could put filters in front of cameras, and you can, uh, you know, put, uh, you make uh, spectral measurements and so on. But but anyway, I, just as an interesting footnote to the history of planetary exploration, that it was actually pushed back against cameras when cameras, I mean, just look at the annals of, of uh, you know, the, the discoveries that have been made in the planetary program and how much of it is, um, is there because of imaging devices. So you're saying these original planetary scientists were boneheaded. That's what you're saying. Oh, no, you said it. You said yeah, it. I said it. it. I'll say it. Okay. I'll say it. Okay, but I you know why we still have boneheaded scientists? I'm just not going to mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> so tell yeah. me about the pale blue dot and Voyager. Okay, so I love talking because, because we're speaking. You lived. You lived it. So this is oral history as well as scientific history. Yes. Right so here I'm, I'm going to tell it. I'm going to tell it to you from my point of view. I was made an imaging team member officially after I graduated. Uh, Caltech in May, and then uh, I finally moved to Arizona to be a postdoc under Brad Smith, the Voyager Imaging Team leader, uh, and that's when I was became an official member of the Voyager Imaging Team. And soon after that, I began hawking around this idea to take a picture of the Earth from the outer solar system, and I had in mind, you know, the perspective that it would give us of our place. I also had in mind that it would show what aliens coming to the Earth would see. You know, they'd say it was a, to take a picture of the Earth and all the other planets. And so... Right, aliens I, coming to the solar system would then see Earth in the distance. Right. Yes, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I just thought this would be a, a cool thing to do. And I began hawking it around. I, be, I spoke to Brad Smith about this. I even ended up speaking to Ed Stone about this. And I was told basically by Ed was Stone... Was Ed Stone the head of the Jet Propulsion Labs back then? Sorry, I, I should be careful about this. Uh, I spoke to Ed Stone about this, who was the project scientist Voyager. Gotcha. Okay. And he would later become... Would he later become head of the Jet Propulsion Lab? Yes, he did for a time. Mm -hmm. He was the head of... Yeah, after Voyager. But but anyway, so um, I, I was told by Ed Stone, you know, no, we're not going to take an image like this unless you can find some science to it. I, Ed was a professor at Caltech and a, one of the, just the, a gem of a guy. And he was trying to encourage me. He said, go find some science you can do with this and maybe we'll do it. And I couldn't think of any and I ended up going off and doing something else. But meanwhile, a few years go by and it's 1988 and I find out that Carl Sagan had proposed the same thing. Uh, he had done it a, a year or two before I did but he was also having trouble getting anyone to, you know, want to get interested in this. Certainly um, not the project leadership, not at Stone, but the other the, the managers at JPL, because they would have been a dangerous thing to do in those days. Take a picture like that, because the high gain antenna on Voyager was always 100% of the time pointed towards the Earth. And they feared if you had to take the high gain antenna off the Earth uh, in order to move the camera into place to take a picture, we might lose the spacecraft. So it turned out not until 1989 was it clear that we were going to be able to do this. Oh, and I should say that 
I told Carl after I found out that he was trying to do it, I met him at a DPS meeting, Division of Planetary Sciences meeting, and said, you know, I was trying to do this too, and I didn't get anywhere. He said, why don't you join me and help us? So I was tasked with computing the exposure times for, uh, for the pictures we were going to take. We ended up taking six, six of the eight planets, and, and, uh, and the picture finally was, happened, and it really happened. This is why Carl really gets the credit here. He had to go to NASA headquarters, speak to NASA headquarters people to get permission and get the funding to take this picture. And I think the funding amounted to, uh, in present day dollars, would have amounted to something like asking for four million dollars. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was asking a lot, I guess, to do this. So anyway, it finally got done, and lots of people poo pooed this idea, and people thought you only it's only going to be less than a pixel. How could this possibly be an interesting, an interesting picture? But as we all know, it's what Carl had to say about it. And the way he romanced it, he turned it into an allegory on the human condition that has turned it, the picture and the phrase pale blue dot, into a meme, if you will. You know, it really, and, and a, um, well, like I said, it's an allegory of, of where we stand. So that, that established a, a almost a protocol in planetary exploration because it seems like every mission since then has taken a picture of the Earth. So there's pictures of, Ma of the Earth taken from the surface of Mars, pictures of the Earth from the Galileo spacecraft on its way to Jupiter and so on. And of course... So Carolyn, I'm, I'm stuck on something. Why would pointing a camera cost $4 million? Uh, because you uh, had... It a was a Kodak. It was a Kodak. Kodak. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the film made of? Like gold? I mean, what? Like what? Is is it the procedures? It, it was just the effort, the overhead. It was keeping the the marching army that at JPL that managed and ran the you know the whole project and and the, this took care of the spacecraft, keeping them all on board for some extra time. That was right. basically part of it. Or most of it. Okay, so it's the, it's during the time you are taking that picture, they're not doing anything else that they should have been doing. And so then you can cost that up and you get to $4 million. That's what you're saying there. Nah, we didn't do that picture until the mission, the Voyager planetary portion of the mission was over. So no, no. Oh, so you have to keep it, you have to keep the marching army marching. That's what it is. Okay. Yes. That yes. That makes sense. Yes. I, 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 it was basically overtime. Is that no. it? <laughs> it's like, we can't do this. We have to pay overtime. <laughs> Everybody gets time and a half. Well, time you and know, a half we can't do. You're laughing, you're laughing but it, weren't, it really was sort of like that. I have to interlude. I have to quick interlude. Um, I have an excerpt here from Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, the book, Go ahead. Go ahead. which is probably among the most quoted sentences of the entire book, if you allow me. I will allow you. Okay, okay, thank you. By the way, you're supposed to be listening to this while you're looking, looking at this pale, at blue, pale dot. blue dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity... In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. And it goes on and on and on. But that, and that's just representatively beautiful of a very long passage, and it's a take on that pale blue dot. So, Carolyn, you wanted to reprise this. So what happened there? Well, uh, I was chosen to be the imaging team leader on Cassini actually just months later. Uh, well, actually, let me let me let me prep you here, just briefly. Um, not many people know who 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 have seen these beautiful passages from Carl about the pale blue dot. That a big part of this recitation is Carl explaining what a pixel is. This was early before that became common knowledge, right? What a pixel, how to think about it, 
um, how much resolution is there. So he goes through a whole disclaimer uh, or, or a primer on how to look at a digital image and what a pixel is and that Earth barely fills a pixel. And But one thing that he did, did not make clear is that Earth barely fills a pixel because of the resolution of the camera. A higher resolution camera would have had many more pixels to represent Earth. But he never really went there. Um, and you're left thinking, oh my gosh, from space, Earth is only one pixel. So we now fast forward, how many years? We go, we go to the, Carolyn is ready to just knock, knock one out of the park. So Carolyn, pick us up at Saturn. Now we're up at now we're up to two pixels. <laughs> well, okay, but let me let me just say let me just say I have to be I'm going to nerd out on you. Is that okay? I'm go, just go yes. for it. I'm just going to say that it's not only the size of the pixel; it is the diffraction limit of the camera that counts too. So there are you know you could have you could have a CCD with a, a billion pixels on a side in you know at the focal plane of your telescope. But if your telescope has a certain diffraction limit, you can't see anything better than that. So, so it's a little bit more tricky. But anyway, fast forward where, where uh, I, I get to be the imaging team leader on Cassini less than a year from the time the Voyager Pale Blue Dot was taken. And I had at the top of my bucket list certain items that I wanted to do. One was... I was going to make sure that we did what the Voyager people really never got a good chance to do, and that was, as much as we could, put out true color images, because I wanted people to see what the solar system, what Saturn and everything in it really looked like. And Ooh. then another was um, where we could uh, take, use the cameras as movie cameras and just take repeated imagery so that we could see phenomena as they were happening. And we did that in spades. And then finally, it was to redo the pale blue dot. And it didn't happen. It didn't really happen. I didn't have the time. We didn't have the, the uh, things just weren't, you know, all set up the way they should. Just mean. again, to put this in, in time context, the Voyager was launched 1977. It was passing Neptune in 1980. So it's done with the planets. No, now 1980. No, 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 no. 1989. Oh, no, 1989. 89. No, no, sorry. Okay. No, but the Pebble Blot was 1990, correct? Valentine's Day, 1990. Gotcha. So it took 13 years to get far enough out beyond the orbit of Neptune for everyone to say, we're done with the Voyager's scientific mission. Now let's do this frivolous stuff, like take a picture of Earth. And so with the $4 million, the... The craft stays online, takes the picture, so now that's 1990. Yes, Pale Blue Dot happened, Valentine's Day, 1990. November 13th, 1990, I get a phone call from NASA headquarters telling me I'm the imaging team leader. I'm sure those people who didn't want to pay overtime were like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so... Uh, and my first team meeting, my first team meeting was, I think, early December of 1990. And that's when I told my, you know, I didn't tell them we wanted, we're going to do the pale blue dot, but that's where I set my goals for the team. But anyway, so fast forward a number of years again to 20, uh, I don't know what it was, 2010, 11. And I'm starting to think, where can I find the time or in the, in the, uh, the plans for all the imagery we were going to do? Uh, where can I slot in another pale blue dot? And in doing that, trying to think of where we were going to put it, it occurred to me how great it would be if we just do the pale blue dot with a twist. And that twist was going to be that I thought, we'll invite people the world over to participate in this. We'll tell them ahead of time, not after the image is taken, like everybody else had done up until that point, we'll tell them ahead of time, at this certain time and date, we're going to take a picture of you here on the Earth. That the window, the picture-taking window lasts 15 minutes. We want you all to go out, you know, straighten up, comb your hair, go out, <laughs> you know, and look up, you know, at the sky. Even if you're on the other side of the Earth, look Wait, up. I saw Chuck in that photo. He had, like... He had spinach in his teeth. And, I, <laughs> and clearly I was not wearing pants. So. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All well, right. 
Anyway, like they wasn't so clear, Chuck. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I remember I remember Carolyn because there were news articles about this to get everybody to participate. So, do you know at the end of the day how many people looked up and smiled? I I don't really know. I think we mm-hmm. estimated tens of thousands. And I really, to be honest with you, I had plans to make it a big event. Um, I even had applied to the TED people. You know the TED conference, right? They give out a million dollar prize for a big project, and I thought this is just going to be up their alley. And I applied to them, and they didn't. Uh, they didn't choose it. But the idea was to just, you know, make it a big event, a teaching moment all around the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that never happened. But anyway, people did participate, and we said, you know, just go out, look up at the sky, think of all of us here on this planet, all of Earth's creatures on one planet. Think of our isolation and the blackness of space and think of how precious life is and our own lives are on this planet and just smile at being alive on a pale blue dot. And that was kind of the directive. And we set up a website and people wrote in and it was really moving for a lot of people. So I was very, and the picture of course turned out like just, it's a killer picture. Stunning with in the shadow of Saturn. It's one of, one of the more brilliant photos I think ever taken. In space. I, I know. Of anything. Was, and it was the first time we ever had seen the Earth and Saturn and the whole thing together just like that. So, uh, and I'm, I've been told, Neil, literally people I know who are in your audiences, this has been happening for years. They write me an email. They say, do you know Neil deGrasse Tyson is showing your image right now? And he's saying great things about you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, thank you for that. Thank you yeah, for that. yeah. I, I, I call you out every time. I say, yeah. Carolyn Porco. Uh, and I also let people know that you're active on social media so they can find you. Okay, um, good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So, Carolyn, when I look at these Cassini images, I'm, I'm often struck by the colors. And so what makes the different colors? Um, the different colors basically come down to two, two different phenomena. One is just basically different materials, different compositions, okay? Different in the atmosphere of Saturn, different compounds organic materials or of one kind or another, uh, they have different colors, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you're seeing in the atmosphere of Saturn. The same thing in the rings, uh, there are impurities in the rings and they give the rings, uh, even though they're mostly water, largely water, they are impurities and they can, from afar, they can uh, look like color to the, your eye. Okay. Of course, it's, it's frozen water, just to be clear. Yeah. It's, fr- it's ice, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, not, ice. it's not a bathtub, right, right. A lot of bathtub. But there are times when you are seeing a phenomenon known as refraction uh, or diffraction to different phenomena that actually they work. Uh, if you're looking at different angles, the object at different angles, you'll see different colors. So it's, it's just light electromagnetic radiation interacting with atoms of different types, different types of atoms that can produce different colors. Okay. And as far as true color goes, um, it was, it's a very hard thing to do to get true color. What you would see, first of all, if you were hanging out, floating above Saturn, first, you have to appreciate what you would see would be a hundred times fainter than what you would see here because Saturn is 10 times farther away from the sun. Oh. So automatically when we take a picture and we expose the picture, we leave the shutter open for longer, for longer longer than your eyes residence time on your retina, we're already cheating. Right. So it's always going to look somewhat different than it would, uh, would to you if you were there. But, we, it wouldn't be cheating, Chuck, if you had huge eyeballs. If, I was going to say, if, I, if, <laughs> if my eyes had CCD chips in them, <laughs> then collecting all those photons, I'd be if you, had Elsa, if you had Elsa-sized mm. eyeballs from we'll Frozen. Do, why don't we do that topic <laughs> another time? Do, let's do That's, true color another time. Yeah, yeah okay, cool, of course, cool. Of yeah. course. I, all right, so, so Carolyn, uh, so when I look at the, think of the inventory of uh, profound photos, of course, uh, Earthrise from Apollo 8 comes to mind. Can you reflect on that? Well, that was, um, that was the first time the globe of people 
first saw the Earth from afar. And in, I mean, that, there had been pictures like it taken, but it wasn't, didn't become as popular as the Apollo 8 moon, uh, Earth rise. And it had to, you know, it, in some sense, it can be, um, you can attribute that, you can attribute the, the, the environmental movement to that picture because it was the first time we see ourselves as a globe. It's an uncorrupted, unpoliticized view of our planet. And, you know, we know, of course, that we all live on it. And it's it just, people have such a powerful, as you must know, when you show that picture, the day the earth smiled, and I've been going around doing the same thing, showing it, people have a very, a very strong response to, to recognizing where and what we are. Yeah. Well, uh, and just just knowing what the Earth would look like in the skies of another world. It's it, it's it's the you are here on the wall. <laughs> right. Exactly. It, <laughs> it's, and it's not only you are here, but you are here on this in, in just insanely small and fragile looking thing with nothing around it. I mean, just com just complete blackness all around. Bear assed in the universe. That's a that's a title of a book. <laughs> Bear yeah. Is that your next book? Is that no, your no, book? I don't know. <laughs> so, Carolyn, can you foresee a photo yet to be taken that might have be as impactful as those that have come before? Um, that sounds like a no. <laughs> I'd have to think. I'd have to think about it. I'd okay, while think. you're thinking, let's go to questions. Chuck, you okay. got some questions from our Patreon members. Yes, we do. All right. And Line them up. What do you have? Let's start off with uh, Casey here. And uh, actually... Uh, uh, and each of these members have been told that we would be speaking to you today, Carolyn. So these are tuned. Yes. These are bespoke for your presence on this oh, program. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So Casey says, Dr. Tyson, Lord Nice, Dr. Porco. Uh, Casey here from Florida with a question for Carolyn. What was the most interesting thing you learned from the Cassini mission? And what upcoming mission has you most excited? I like that. All right. Oh, gee. I mean, what we learned so many things, so okay, many. Okay, pick your favorite child then. Because. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give two. Can I give two? All right, two. Okay, two. One, it's what everybody expects me to say because really is the thing that has grabbed me ever since we found it, and that was learning what what exists uh, on Enceladus. It's the ocean that has got just in, uh, complex organic compounds on it, has hints of hydrothermal activity that presumably is taking place on the seafloor of Enceladus as an ocean underneath it. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. And, and it's expressing itself into space in the form of geysers and a plume that we can flu fly through. Cassini flew through it to sample it. And we know a lot about it now. And, um, and it's just, it really is, despite what anybody else tells you, it is the low-hanging fruit in our solar system to go search for life. And Whoa. to be to be at the forefront of that, I mean, we took the pictures. We were the ones who found the hundred geysers, you know, lofting into space. Uh, and there's um, there's good reason to believe that uh, very good reason to believe that that ocean uh, with it that the geysers are coming out of four fractures of the south polar terrain. And there's good reason to believe that the liquid water from which those uh, geysers are created comes all the way up to the surface. Literally, wow. like it could be like old faithful, except not with an intermittent kind of character, but water that comes all the way up to the surface. And I mean, it just doesn't get any more exciting than that. Well, if there are fish down there, then some of the fish might have come up in the geyser. You could have freeze dried fish on the surface of Enceladus. No. Because <laughs> Why not? No, not my story. That's a good story, Carolyn. It's, it's, it's keep bad. my story. Bad, bad, bad. It's bad. It's bad Go. because it's bad because there's very. It's not likely there's complex life down there. You need more energy that is a, than is available there. But microbes. Hey, microbes are cool. Don't disrespect microbes. Okay, so microbes float up in there on the surface. Well, I said, I've always said it could be snowing microbes in those geysers. Okay, there you go. Okay. All right. You like okay. my fish? All right, I'll give you the microbes. Okay. Give me a, give me a microbe. I'll take a microbe okay. any day. I still like fish, but all right, go That's on. That's all right. And, and, but... and what upcoming space mission, planetary mission, do you most look forward to? 
Uh, well, okay, so I'm, I, I'm not, I won't be around for it, but when we go back to Enceladus, land on the surface, and we can do the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. We can measure the geophysical activity underneath the surface seismically. We can, uh, we can stand there and just have the stuff fall on us. We could collect to our heart's content, and we could really do a bang-up job. Uh, searching for life in that Enceladus ocean. And, and apparently you expect to be dead. You, you expect to be dead by then. Well, it's going to take so long before that happens. Right. Okay. How, how yeah. do we make sure before we go back that when we land, we don't contaminate, if there are microbes ooh, there? Ooh, good good ooh. question. Good question. Ooh. Good question. And this brings up, boy, this brings another topic. I don't know if we want to do it this time or, or <laughs> another time. Uh, you know, NASA treats this as, for all the criticisms people have, about NASA, they treat planetary protection very seriously. So we would have to go back with an absolutely like pristine, clean spacecraft contaminated with no microbes from Earth, or else you know we could be measuring our own uh, our own uh, you know viruses. Scum. Yeah. So we don't want to do that. So, but but it this puts this puts before us the specter of having the people from the commercial space side of things now just crazily flying into space with what will be hundreds of thousands of satellites of low Earth orbit. They're talking about missions to go to Enceladus. They want to, they, I've heard plans to, to go land on Enceladus or fly through its plume. Uh, I, I doubt any commercial enterprise will ever be able, would want to spend the money, you know, it's actually Work over the bucks to ensure the cleanliness of a spacecraft. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. so it's got to be NASA to lead this. Otherwise, we worry about forward contamination right. of what it is we're trying to observe. That's what I was trying right. to say, Neil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All well, right. No. All yeah, right. that makes sense. NASA, NASA cares, and you know, NASA every, care. <laughs> everybody else just wants the money. So. And, and, and Carolyn, uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn, yeah. is one of the plumes from Enceladus make one of the rings of Saturn? Isn't there some ring made by a plume? It's not just, well, all the, there's geysers. There's hundreds, there's a hundred that we counted. My research group, actually, this is my own research. We counted about a hundred individual geysers, but if you had higher resolution, there's probably more. All those geysers make a plume. So don't get confused. There's hundreds of geysers. Oh. They all make a plume. We showed that those geysers, the, the biggest among them, the, the most, you know, pronounced, uh, actually, most of that stuff falls down, the solid stuff falls down on the ground, back on Enceladus, but some 4% of the material ends up going into the E-ring. It forms the E-ring. Wow. Yeah, so, okay. That's very cool. Yes, it was very cool. And we showed <clears throat> that we did modeling simulations of these um, tendrils that you see coming off Enceladus uh, long distances, tens of thousands of kilometers away, and we could show that they were created by the geysers. So it was a, uh, it was like a slam dunk. It was really cool. By the way, the Pentagon has an E ring. Just thought I'd tell you. Oh, case. all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind. So what did I hear recently, Carolyn, about uh, tasking the James Webb Space Telescope to look at this very phenomenon? Yes, the James Webb Space Telescope, which, by the way, I'm sure it's blown your mind. It's blown my mind. It's blown everybody's minds. It's just fantastic the way that whole thing has been working perfectly. And it also took a look at Enceladus. Okay, we've never seen the plume from, you know, anywhere other than Saturn. Actually, Voyager also saw the plume, but faintly. Uh, and here we have James Webb now has the ability to look uh, at this plume and monitor it. And, and there's a collection of scientists. They were the, the team that did this. Uh, and they're, you know, they're going to keep looking at it. I guess what I'm saying, it means that we can continue to monitor it before the mission goes back long after I'm dead. That's what I mean. Okay, there you go. Unless you live forever, which might still happen. All right, so Chuck, time for a couple more questions. What do you have? Okay, here we go. This is Samuel Tomka. And Samuel says, hello, Dr. Porco. Uh, greetings from Slovakia. My name is Samuel, and I was wondering, will the day come when we can live stream video as our probes allow us to watch in real time flybys 
of celestial bodies. Why don't Ooh. we already have such a system in place? Yeah. So videos, um, okay, so what are we, the question is, you know, you're not going to have somebody out there taking a video of a spacecraft flying by a planet. So he doesn't mean those kind of videos. Uh, and we actually have sort of done things like that. I mean, to, you know, remember video is lots and lots of data volume and you have to get that stuff down to the ground. And, and we have lots of instruments that want to take data and get their data down to the ground. So you, we can't take an indefinite amount of data volume, even though it would be cool to do. So videos take a lot of uh, space. Uh, a lot of downlink, we call it. So, uh, but we have, we did take imagery. Uh, we did this. You could look at the cyclops.org website, and we have a little page called theater uh, where, and video clips or whatever. Well, we made video clips, for example, when we flew by Iapetus, and we put together some imagery. It's, you know, it's kind of clunky, but we were able to show what it looked like as we went by. So, Cyclops uh, uh, is the name of what, then? It stands for Cassini Imaging Central Laboratory for Operations. So it's C I C L O P S, and it was Ops. the center. It was the center where we, we, the imaging team, actually my staff members and I, uh, set up the uplink and downlink operations for the imaging team. Nice. Okay. Nice. okay. And now, since that's disbanded and there's no more of that, Cyclops.org is the website. That's my website where cool. all the. Uh, the Saturn imagery is, and lots of other stuff is put. We can find it there. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Yes. All right. Chuck, give me more. Okay. This is Captain James Riley, and he says, hello, Dr. Porco. I've heard that the Hubble deep field image was used, uh, was a use of director's time aimed at an empty point in space. Since that worked out so well, are we doing more at aiming at empty spots or are there telescopes scheduled to pretty much lock up on things that we just want a better look at like nothing? <laughs> I, I think I think there are there are telescopes on the ground and Neil probably knows this better than I do. Telescopes uh, that are on spacecraft or are planned to be on spacecraft that will do surveys of the entire sky. So they're not just looking at one tiny little bit. They're doing entire surveys. Well, just to be clear, it's not a survey of known objects. It's just a survey of areas of the sky, no matter what's there. That's it's the a, matter. Okay. It's a survey yeah. of the sky, the entire sky. Okay, so that's better than just, you know, looking at one little spot. And this brings up something I would love to talk about if we can, and that is that there are plans for enormous telescopes, ground-based telescopes, the giant Magellan telescope, uh, the extra large telescope. I, these are just enormous telescopes to be built on the ground to be able to look at the heavens from the surface of the earth. And um, I am deeply concerned about all the the traffic that will be in low Earth orbit uh, that is going to all these satellites, these internet constellations that are going to impair ground-based observations, not only in the visible because they'll be streaking across fields of view uh, and there's going to be many, many more of them in the future, but also in the radio region of the spectrum, it's going to harm radio observations, even search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And you know what else it'll do? It creates signatures of moving objects in the sky when you might be trying to find an asteroid that has our name on it headed for, towards us. And if the noise level of imagery goes up, you could possibly lose one of these killer asteroids. There's, there's lots of bad things that could happen. And right now the whole thing is just, it's poorly, if, if at all, regulated. It's, there's insufficient monitoring, tracking, there are all protocols for what happens in the event of a, of an a imminent crash. crash. Yeah. Uh, really, I I'll, think the, I'll say it again. NASA cares. Everybody else just wants the money. Well, NASA, <laughs> NASA is supporting this. I was very, very disturbed to find out that they're, you know, they want to encourage this, and I think it's a bad thing. As of about nine months ago, and it could very well have changed, there were proposed and approved satellites a totaling totaling 430,000 
That's and there's insane. now and there's now no actually as of about six months ago there was six thousand up there, and yeah. in order to appreciate what this means, before mid 2019, which was the first launch of the Starlink SpaceX Starlink satellite, before that, six and a half decades of exploration by nation states had left an accumulation of 3,700 satellites in orbit around the Earth. About half mm. of them were alive, about half of them were dead. And as of about, what did I say, six months ago, I think it was? Six months, Maybe nine yeah. months ago, there were 6,000. And there are proposed, and maybe already, already approved and proposed, 430,000. That's 70 that's times what's up there now. So we, it's the end of the night sky. The end of the yeah. night sky. Oh, that's yeah. another thing I want to say is the night sky, <laughs> the night sky belongs to all of us. It's the only thing you can lay your eyes on that's 13.8 billion years old. I go to the night sky to check in on the meaning of my life. I mean that. Mm. It, where, where else can you find that kind of perspective? You know, mm. and, and it will be ruined. It will be ruined not only for professional astronomers, it will be ruined for people who just love to look up and remember where they really are. Yeah, uh, you know, our my my uh, ending comment on every show is keep looking up. And now it's like keep looking up and look at all the satellites. <laughs> it's all it is. That's all you're going to see. It's, uh, yeah. Chuck, we might have time for one more question. What, what else? All right. One more to slip in there. Yeah. Uh, wow, that was that was disturbing what we just yeah, talked yeah. about. Uh, well, it doesn't fit in with your humor thing, so I don't know if you'll it, use it, but... Well, no. It, 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 <laughs> believe it or not, we've had uh, Mor Baja, who is a uh, uh, he. What he? Uh, what's he? An orbital he deals, dynamicist specializing in cleaning up the space, space environment. Space junk. Yeah. Right. Oh, good. Yeah, so he's in the so, Department of Aerospace Engineering at uh, University of Texas at Austin. Absolutely. So, Mor Baja. So, yeah. Mor Baja. Yeah. So check out his mm -hmm. work. Uh, okay, here we go. This is Mohammed Saif, and he says. Hello, Dr. Tyson. Hello, Dr. Porco. And hopefully Chuck. Well, thank you, Mohammed. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> he says, my name is Saif from the land down under. And my question for Carolyn is, as a part of your association with Cassini, Voyager, and New Horizon, what is the least known but most fascinating thing you have seen or noticed? Oh, my goodness. So, um, yeah. What's, okay. what's the thing we would never see or know that you know? She can't talk about that. This yeah. is <laughs> but, okay, the second most well, fascinating. <laughs> well, okay, so here's something that um, I, th I think is fascinating, and most people don't know about it. Um, we found, again, this is my research group, we found in the rings of Saturn a type of... Um, wave in near the outer edge of the B-ring, which I had done my thesis on many, many years ago. So I was anxious to look more closely at this. And we found evidence of these free, uh, normal modes of the rings where these waves are sloshing back and forth uh, from the place where they get self-excited. These are not waves that are excited by a, an orbiting satellite. They're self-excited. They slosh up again. They, they they travel up against the B-ring, the outer edge of the B-ring, which is held by a resonance with Mimas. It's held sharp. They reflect off the outer edge of the B-ring. They travel inwards. They reflect off their inner uh, origin point. They go back and forth and back and forth, and they can be amplified. And they're spiral waves. They can be amplified, and you can uh, see them actually in the motion of the outer edge of the B-ring. And the reason why this is so exciting is because these kind of waves are predicted to exist in protoplanetary disks around, protostellar disks around stars, and even in spiral galaxies. In fact, they can be responsible for the spiral arms in galaxies, and you can't measure their motion in a galaxy because the orbital, the periods, the rotation periods in a galaxy are like 200 million years. Yeah. But yeah. we found the smaller version of them, the Saturn ring equivalent in Saturn's ring. So it really was so thrilling to find something that really exists on a galactic scale 
And we found evidence of it in Saturn's rings. Wow. Love it. I love it. In fact, that's a that's a scientist's great dream to to discover something in their own field that affects other fields as well. Yeah. In this case, it's all astrophysics, but uh, it's not often that the planetary folks talk to the galactic folks. That I know. Like hardly ever well, happens. Well, we we made it. We put it out there, so it's there for people yeah, well, to know. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Very cool. Thank you. One last thing, I, I want to ask. I got this. I'm going to end with this question. Go ahead. What's up with that hexagon on Saturn's south pole? <laughs> the hexagon. Everybody loves a hexagon. Whenever I, we... I don't. Hexagons don't belong in a gas. Okay. Okay. So, so what make? Thank you, Chuck. Mm. That's how I felt. Uh, Chuck, Chuck, look at it's, it's like a perfect hexagon yeah, made well, out of gas. That's uh, if I'm made out of gas, I ain't giving you a hexagon. Yeah, it's got to tell you, I no, am no. made out of gas, and I'm letting you know right now, no hexagons here. <laughs> <laughs> so take us out with what the hell that was. Where okay, is. so I'll, I just want to say though, whenever we posted anything about the hexagon on our website, the hits went through the roof. Yeah. Because people yeah. couldn't get their, their head around this. And people really, there were people who genuinely thought it was crystal energy. There must be something inside Saturn creating this. It is a jet stream. Just like the polar jet stream we have here on the Earth, it is a, a, just a, a river of, of gas that if you took it and stretched it out, so it's circling the pole, right? We'll just take it, stretch it out, it would be a six, six waves, six conjoined waves, crests and troughs, just like that. But when you take it and you wrap it around a globe, it gives the impression that it has sides. But that's just because you're stretching out the, uh, what are you stretching out? You're stretching out the crests. The crests suddenly become stretched out. And so that's what it is. And it's, um, and the reason, the reason why we found it on Voyager, it's still screaming around at something like 220 miles an hour, going around Saturn, you know, 30, 40 years, whatever it is since Voyager uh, went and saw it at Saturn. It's because any atmospheric systems on Saturn or any of the giant planets that get started up, they don't run down because you don't have a solid surface underneath the atmosphere of any of the giant planets. So there's no friction to run them down. Once they get started, they continue. It's the same thing with the Great and Red Spot. Jupiter, right. The Great Red Spot has been doing that for hundreds of years. Right. At, at least, least. Hundred, at least at hundreds least. of years. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Gonna, I'm just going to say that's, a, that's awfully convenient there, Carolyn. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's think... convenient? What's convenient? <laughs> uh, you just have a perfect little explanation for straight lines and... In nature. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. You, here's what? how to say that, Chuck. Here, Chuck, here's how to say that. Say, Carolyn, if it's so obvious, why wasn't it predicted to be there before anyone found it? Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things that are obvious in hindsight that no one took the time to predict. So, Okay, that's the answer. So, hi, Carolyn, thank you for being on Star Talk once again. You're a Always good friend great. of our show. In fact, you even hosted Star Talk All Stars back when that That's was a running right. uh, part of our portfolio. So I want to thank you for your service. No, as it were. Thank, thank you for having me. I love being here. It's fun and, being and, with and you guys. I need affirmation. It's okay if we call you Madam Saturn. That's okay. Continue calling me Madam Saturn. Like okay. you know, you know, like like you, Saturn is probably my favorite planet after the Earth. Yes. Okay. But ne we're Neptune, in... Neptune is a close third. No, not for me. No. A close second. A close second. I'm sorry. Neptune would be a close second. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> this has been Star Talk, and I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bidding you to keep looking up.